funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. While most people know about the Great Famine of 1845 to 1850, which caused over a million deaths and hundreds of thousands of Irish to emigrate from their native land, not too many people realise that various mini-famines continued to occur in many parts of Ireland, especially in western counties such as Mayo, from the 1850s right up to the 1890s. For example, in January 1880, during the height of the Irish Famine Crisis of 1879-1881, to the parish priest of Gisla in Bangerers, County Mayo, wrote a letter to the Lord Mayor of Dublin, who was in charge of the Mansion House Famine Relief Fund. In that letter he pleaded for help for his starving parishioners. My dear Lord Mayor, knowing well your kindness of heart and the deep interest you have always shown on behalf of the poor, I humbly beg to call your Lordship's attention to the dire distress prevailing in this locality. Gisela is a remote district of Eris and belongs to the Diocese of Kilala. The poor people have been at all times remarkable in their simple piety, good order and industry. But their many virtues and good qualities could not avert misfortune over which they have no influence. They have no food and are in despair. I hope you will kindly take them under your protection and save my poor people. And in a similar vein, in late 1879, the Freeman's Journal newspaper in Dublin sent a special reporter to investigate the worsening situation in the west of Ireland. He reported, I have come across them, buried in the gloom of their cabins, their frightful silent circles, the shivering half-naked children huddled together for warmth, the mother rocking a little box of dirty rags in which a blue-lipped little baby is sleeping. The man, with his hat over his eyes, his head bent down to his knees, his eyes staring fixedly forward with a dull stare, so sluggardized by want and despair that he hardly turns when he tells you, in his hopeless way, that his last potato was eaten a fortnight ago. By late 1879, a famine crisis had engulfed most of Ireland, in particular along the west coast of Ireland, leaving at least one million people in dire need of relief and assistance. Dr. Gerard Morn, Associated Researcher with the Social Science Research Centre in NUI, Galway. And the crisis that takes place, the counties which were most severely affected were Donegal, Mayo, Galway, Kerry, but virtually all counties had a crisis because relief is being provided in 28 of the 32 counties. All down the western seaboard was particularly affected. Donegal, Clare, Kerry, but really the epicentre of this famine was Mayo and Galway. Dr Regina Donnellan, postdoctoral research fellow in NUI, Galway. Here's Gerard Morn once again. It's the west of Ireland that mainly suffers because... Of the two and a half million who live along the west of Ireland, one million of these are in crisis in 1879-1880 and have to be supported. However, unlike the Great Irish Famine 30 years previously, with the famine crisis of 1879-1881, many domestic and international charities and groups undertook a gargantuan mobilisation of relief to avert disaster. Some of the most prominent of these were the Mansion House Relief Committee, the Duchess of Marlborough Relief Committee and the New York Herald Relief Fund. This is the inspirational story of how their collective endeavour helped to save thousands of Irish people from doom. A lot of relief agencies were established and the poured fantastic relief into the western region. A lot of collections took place in America and England. They really mobilised because they saw things are getting out of hand. There is a sense of urgency to kind of get solutions in place, that techniques can be put in place, that this famine can be avoided. 
you do not have the same mortality levels that you have in the 1840s because the international community's response is just so quick. Charity really took over for this famine. But before investigating how over a million Irish people were saved from doom, first we need to briefly examine the roots of the famine crisis of 1879 to 1881. In other words, what caused the crisis in the first place? Dr. Frank Rinn, lecturer in British and American Civilization at the University of Sergei Pontois in France. What happened is there was a relative prosperity in Ireland in the early 1870s and in some ways uh, what occurs to me looking at it now after what we've been through in Ireland in the last 10 years is in some ways what you had is a credit bubble a credit bubble that rose up out of you know relatively good agricultural prices uh, the economy not doing badly after a crisis in the 1860s and freely available credit in the early 1870s and into the mid 1870s which was followed by three disastrous winters where it rained, the weather was appalling and harvests failed, whether it was tillage, uh, whether it was a a grain crop, whether it was a root crop, whatever aspect of agriculture you were in with that type of inclement weather for three years, right across Ireland and also right across Europe, you had crisis. And the crisis was also matched by a fall in agricultural prices globally. And so the farmers and the tenants of Ireland were being hit on two sides. This obviously by the winter of 1878 was very bad. So by 1879, early 1879, there was the word famine was being used in the newspapers with reference to the Irish situation. And people were fearing another great famine. And two other important factors which greatly contributed to the crisis were the huge decline in seasonal migration and also the failure of the kelp industry. Dr. Gerard Morn. It's a combination of factors which led to the famine of 1879. First of all, you had a situation with the seasonal migration because, okay, it's seasonal migration remittances. You're talking about in the region of about 100,000 people who migrated every year to Great Britain. And... By the late 1870s, this was coming under pressure on account of the mechanisation of British agriculture with the introduction of machinery such as the McCormick Reaper. And as a result, in 1879, what was coming back in remittances was about 250,000 a year. But in 1879, it was down to about 100,000. If you look at it at a micro level in a place like on Eccle Island, where about 1,000 people migrated to Britain every year, on average, it brought back about £10,000, but it was down to about £2,000 in 1879. So there was a problem in the paying of rent because, OK, this money was not available. Two very important uh, sources of income for the farmers along the West Coast would have been the kelp industry and the seasonal migration. Kathleen Villiers Tuttle, Connemara historian and also author of the book Patient Endurance, The Great Famine in Connemara. From the point of view of the kelp industry, Because of the availability of this long kelp seaweed, which was harvested and then burnt down, and then it produced a kind of resin which was used in manufacturing industries, in linen industry, in the manufacture of glass, that sort of thing. So it was a very important source of revenue for the for the local people. But it tended to rise and fall depending on the market generally because it sometimes it could be supplemented by a chemical. And if this chemical was readily available, then the kelp market wasn't as good. And this is what happened at that particular time in 1879. The kelp market had collapsed because the prices that they were receiving it had gone from £7 to £2 per tonne. So that was a very important factor. And another factor which contributed to the 1879 famine crisis was increasing agricultural competition from the United States. Gerard Morn. In the 1870s, you had the opening up of areas like the Midwest, Wisconsin, Minnesota, etc. And farmers there were able to produce goods much cheaper than they could in Europe because they didn't have to pay rents etc. So that you found that wheat, cereals, etc. were much, much cheaper and 
European agriculture was not able to compete with them. But the most important factor which comes on with this, and this is the failure of the potato crop in 1879. Now, while the potato crop, its consumption had declined quite considerably, there are areas along the west coast in which the potato was still exclusively used as the main food source. In 1879, as a result of an extremely wet summer, you had a situation whereby the potato crop, the yield was only 1.4 tonnes per acre. Now, to put this in perspective, the yield was actually lower than it was in 18, Black 47. The harvest of 1879 was as serious as the failure of the harvest in 1847. And as historian Frank Ruin touched on a short while ago, a major contributory factor to the 1879 famine crisis was the 1870s credit crunch. Most Irish tenant farmers depended on credit for their survival, especially credit from their local shopkeepers. Bernard O'Hara, historian and also author of the biography entitled David. Farming has very much seasonal income and most farmers would have ran up a bill with their, their, their local shop and this bill was only cleared off when stock was sold or seasonal migration from England or immigrants' remittances came in. So yes, the local shop was a big part of the local economy and all of them would have ran credit accounts for all their customers. In 1876-1877 you have a financial crisis in the States where one of the banks goes bust and it has implications in Europe where banks start withdrawing credit to people. The result of this is that shopkeepers are now being squeezed so they are no longer providing the credit facilities to tenant farmers. We do know that okay, in many of the towns along the western seaboard that Many of the shopkeepers were owed substantial amounts of money. Okay, in places like okay, Burtonport and Donegal, where there's a figure of something like 20,000 is given. We know in places like Castle Bar, the number of shopkeepers were owed up to £50,000. Now, these are enormous amounts of money for the particular period. So as a result of the squeeze that shopkeepers were under, they were unable now to extend credit to tenant farmers at a time when they needed it. Gerard Morn. And the net result of this lack of credit to farmers combined with the failure of successive potato crops, the huge decline in seasonal migration and the kelp industries, as well as increased agricultural competition from the United States, was that by late 1879 over a million Irish people were in dire straits and facing starvation. Dr Frank Rin. They were in absolute fear with lack of availability of cash, a lack of availability of an alternative food source, that they would actually be starvations. You do have a crisis. By 1879, things were coming to a climax. The level of destitution is very, very high. The notion of famine stalked the nation, and it led to a huge political crisis. And as was mentioned earlier, the 1879 famine crisis was very severe in the west of Ireland, in particular in counties like Mayo. The county that was affected most would have been County Mayo. You're talking about the county as a whole. Some parts suffered much worse than others, but overall the county was in crisis. You have areas like Bangareras in Mayo where virtually all of the population are in need of help. Right from 1879, spring, summer, autumn, winter, the whole way to 1881, the people of Mayo are suffering almost indescribably. Dr Regina Donnan of NUI, Galway. Their situation is horrific. Mayo, it's, it's almost impossible to state how badly this famine struck Mayo. So just how did word of the famine crisis first become general public knowledge? George Moore. The first ones who really indicate that there is a crisis are the local clergy, that their flocks are having problems. You have a whole series of petitions that are sent 
to Dublin during the summer of 1879 by clergymen, etc. And Something to the figure of 166 memorials memorial. are sent to the Lord Lieutenant. There's a hundred, yes, there's 166 memorials sent by elected representatives. But the thing was, they were largely disregarded because the attitude in Dublin was that the Irish were prone to exaggeration and that everybody was saying that the situation was much worse in order that they could get whatever limited resources were actually available. But it is not until December of 1879 that there is an official recognition that you do have a crisis. And the reason that it's an official recognition, it is the wife of the Lord Lieutenant who actually establishes a relief committee. This is the Duchess of Marlborough. Now, the fact that, okay, the wife of the Lord Lieutenant establishes a relief committee is a clear indication to the British establishment that there is a famine situation in Ireland. And why did she establish? What was her raison d'etre? Was it a personal endeavour or was it kind of from above, so to speak? No, it was a personal endeavour. She had become aware of how bad the crisis was from correspondence that was being sent in to her husband. And I would say she did have philanthropic views in relation to helping the poor. Certainly from the point of view of somebody who would be considered probably to be an unexpected participant in the relief that took place in 1879-1880 would have been the wife of the Viceroy, the Duchess of Marlborough. Professor Catherine Shannon of Westfield State University in Massachusetts, USA. Taking up the cause of organizing a fund for relief uh, is an interesting thing for her to do, given the fact that, of course, her husband was representing a Tory administration who didn't necessarily have very sympathetic views about Ireland's complaints about grievances. And indeed, when she came up with the idea of setting up a relief fund, her son, Lord Randolph Churchill, the father of Winston Churchill, He had some reservations about her getting involved in this, more or less suggesting that, well, maybe the reports of of dire conditions were exaggerated. But uh, she persevered. She raised a great deal of money, was particularly effective in getting English money for the relief. So just how much did the Duchess of Marlborough put herself out for the people of Ireland? Regina Donnan. The Duchess of Marlborough, there's no doubt that she was taking risks both socially, politically, in her attempt and in her aim to improve the situation in the West of Ireland. She really did go above and beyond what was required of her, even in terms of her benevolence and just her her general charitable nature. Like, all of those good characteristics aside, she really went above and beyond to try and help the people of the West of Ireland. And we'll hear more later about the work of the Duchess of Marlborough and the Relief Committee, which she established in helping to alleviate Irish famine distress. But first, it's worth asking what was the government's response to the crisis after the Duchess of Marlborough put it on notice in December 1879. Dr Frank Rin of the University of Sergei Pontois. The government responded in that it allowed for this very large fund, I think it was £350,000 at first. There was a fund that was available through a system of where the, the local boards of guardians could apply for funds for improvements of the locality by way of loans that were relatively low interest at the time. And these loans would be guaranteed by Board of Guardians, so guaranteed by local taxes. The problem with these type of things is the amount of money that was being dispensed was being dispensed under strange rules. Works had to be completed by the end of July that year. And this is 1880 we're talking about. 
And if they weren't finished by the end of July, then you couldn't apply for the money. Well, the point people were saying was we can't apply for the money because we can't finish that work by that time. So even in January 1880, when the you know, money was available, the res- constraints on getting it actually made it impossible for some people to get that money. And in other words, the criteria was just too hard. Too hard. It wasn't going to work. And then I think when I looked at Ballad the Hob and Skull, I think that they asked for a certain amount of money. I think they may have gotten something like 10% of that amount of money. And then what actually happened was that private charities or public charities, the Mansion House Fund and other funds, actually provided more money than the government were providing in those districts, which seemed to negate the idea that the government was really stepping up to the plate. The government does provide a certain amount of help, largely through the poor law system. But overall, the government do not really engage in the same way as the private relief organisations. George Morn. Here's historian Catherine Shannon. The British government didn't want a massive famine, certainly. And there was some intervention. Whether it was enough, you know, is another question. And while questions surrounded the official response to the crisis, in contrast, private charity intervened massively to help Ireland. By late 1879 and early 1880, several charity relief groups had been established. Frank Rin. The uh, Lord Mayor of Dublin had a fund. There was the Mansion House Fund. And this was a fund that was set up with, um, you know, the great and the good were formed the committee and they attempted to raise funds. Then there was Lady Marlborough Fund and Lady Marlborough was the Lord Lieutenant's wife. So this is all very high society. Lady Marlborough was the Lord Lieutenant's wife. So she was basically the equivalent of the Viceroy's wife. The Lord Lieutenant was the Queen's representative or the, the, the most senior government representative here in Ireland during the Union. And um, so that was all genteel, well-meaning. And then you had the various American organizations, mostly associated with the Fenian movement, who were mobilized to give funds. And then that was put under the banner of the Land League. And the other principal groups involved in famine relief were the New York Herd Relief Fund, the Canadian Government Fund, and also the Catholic Church and the International Catholic Community. Now we'll discuss their work shortly. But first, it's worth investigating where the bulk of the money used to help Irish famine victims came from. Gerard Moore. You find you have now got an Irish nation in exile. And when the Irish nation in exile finds out about this famine, the amount of money that is sent back by the Irish through different organisations, through the Land League, who had a relief committee, through the Catholic Church, through the Mansion House Relief Committee. In actual, the country that provides the most relief during the 1879 to 81 crisis is actually Australia. The point that has made is that money that is collected in towns in rural Australia one week later is being distributed in relief in places like Connemara and in Mayo. You know. So it just shows how quick, how everything is expedited. And part of the reason for this is that the knowledge is disseminated much quicker 30 years after the Great Famine compared to what it was like in the 1840s. Why Australia, Jerry? Well, you have to remember, in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, large numbers of Irish immigrated to Australia. Many of these had done extremely well compared to their counterparts who went to North America. What we do know as well is that the Irish who go to Australia they are not good at sending back remittances, largely because they come from middle-class families back in Ireland. So remittances are not as important as they are in the poorer communities. But when it comes to a crisis, you find that the Irish in Australia are prepared to dig very, very deep in order to help back home. But it wasn't just Australia who came to Ireland's rescue in 1880. Also to the fore was the United States. Professor Catherine Shannon of Westfield State University in Massachusetts. 
The U.S. reaction to the news from Ireland was quick and swift and very, very generous and certainly quite supportive of Parnell when he came over to the States to raise money for famine relief as well as for the party, for the political movement. And he undertook an extensive tour of the United States, as did Michael Davitt. And the responses that they got were were very, very generous. Now, in my home city of Boston, the response was quite strong, partly because of the very, very good reportage of what was going on in Ireland that was published in the Boston Pilot, which was basically the paper of record for Irish Americans to find out what was going on in Ireland. And, of course, its editor at that time was John Boyle O'Reilly, a former Fenian who had been transported to Australia, escaped from there, and came to the United States and became a very, very successful and influential journalist. And O'Reilly created a lot of space in his newspaper for that, even having columnists who had come over to Ireland and done series of reports and send the, sent them back. In addition to that, there were very many public meetings in Boston, about us, including one in Fanel Hall, the famous public hall in Boston, and the Charitable Irish Society of Boston, the oldest Irish organization in the Americas, did the same thing at this time that they did in 1847. They canceled their annual St. Patrick's Day dinner in 1880 and donated the proceeds for the Famine Relief Fund for the West of Ireland. And uh, many of the people who were in the organization got involved in the fundraising that sent relief money back. But the American government as well, in March of 1880, hired a boat and wheat and other sort of cereals that had been collected in the United States were dispatched on this boat, which arrived in Cork, and the food was to be then distributed throughout the country. Historian George Morn. You even had the Irish in India, because, okay, they're quite a sizable Irish community in the British Army in India. And when word got round of a crisis, they were prepared almost immediately to start a collection to send money to Ireland. So really, Jerry, the diaspora answered the call, the diaspora come to the rescue. Uh, the, yeah, the diaspora come to the rescue, but also the international community. And in, in many ways, you can call it the kindness of strangers. Um, on account of the fact, yeah, it was the legacy and the memory of, of the Great Famine, which is the first major famine in Europe in modern times. That memory resonated amongst many, many communities, the Irish in particular, but also the international community who come to the aid very quickly of the starving Irish. People, you know, had to kind of rally together to fight this, and people were afraid. It would have been as bad as what happened in the 1840s, where I suppose a million people died and a million immigrated. But it was more short-lived. It banded people together. Historian John Reid of the Michael Davitt Museum, situated in Strayed, County Mayo. Here's Regina Dunn. This famine and the relief effort was a worldwide phenomenon. And while the Irish diaspora and the international community came to Ireland's aid during the 1879 to 1881 famine crisis, more closer to home, several Irish-based relief groups such as the Duchess of Marlborough Relief Committee were also doing Trojan work. Gerard Morn. The Duchess of Marlborough Relief Committee, which was established in December of 1879 by the wife of the Lord Lieutenant and its main role is money is sent, especially from Commonwealth countries and from England, and sent to Dublin, which was then redistributed largely on a county basis, county or Porto Union basis. And the Duchess of Marlborough Relief Committee distributed around £135,000 of relief throughout Ireland to help alleviate famine distress. Now that's the equivalent of millions of euro in modern money. However, perhaps the largest and most prominent of all Irish-based relief groups was the Mansion House Relief Committee. It was established by 
Edward Dwyer Gray, who at the time was the proprietor of the Freeman's Journal, but he was also Lord Mayor of Dublin at the time. Now, its money, again, came from all over the world. The money came from all over the world, from Europe, North America, India, Australia. There was even, I think, a report of a women's convict boat which was en route to Australia and the women actually collected whatever money they could put together and sent it to the Mansion House Relief Committee. And as far as I know, the boat that they were on actually sank en route to Australia after that. Historian Regina Donlan. So just how much word of relief did the likes of the Mansion House Relief Committee distribute? George Moore. The figure is something like 180,000 that it expands when it's in existence between 1879 and August of 1880. Um, The way that it distributed its money, it was on a parish level. And what happened was the parish had to set up a committee. On this committee, you had to have a Church of Ireland, or Protestant representative, and a Catholic representative. On the ground, it, it operated on a parish basis, so you would get somebody like the parish priest who would, you know, write to the committee saying, we need clothes, we need food, we need subsistence of some form. And then the committee would evaluate the application and send the relevant aid to communities. We know that in Montpellier, in Galway, there were something like 3,000 people in need of relief, according to the local relief committee. It distributed the money to about 860 local relief committees throughout the country, the vast majority of them in Mayo and Galway and Donegal. But also, we do know, okay, there's about 12 of these local relief committees established in a relatively well-off county like Kildare. And another group which really helped Ireland during the famine crisis of 1879 to 1881 was the Canadian government, Gerard Morn. The Canadian government provided 100,000 Canadian dollars in 1880. The idea being that this money will be used for economic development and in particular the construction of harbours for the development of the fishing industry. They instituted a scheme of pier building so that the the fishermen will be able to land their fish safely. And that is primarily how the money raised and donated by the Canadian government was spent. The representatives from the Mansion House Relief Committee and the Duchess of Marlborough Committee, they came together and they toured the west of Ireland. And this resulted in the building of a number of piers along the Mayo coast. For example, the piers at Mulrani, Runa, Tonaton Valley and Lacken were all built as a result of this Canadian fund. Peer building was one example of how they were coming together and thinking of these innovative ways of improving the situation for families in Mayo and and Connemara and beyond these badly affected areas. The Canadian Fund also provided money so that fishing boats could be repaired, new fishing boats could be bought, fishing gear was repaired, a number of nets, new nets were bought for fishermen out of this money. And so While on the one hand there was a push towards, you know, providing subsistence in terms of food and clothing, there was also plans put in place so that these communities could become self-sustainable even in times of famine. And that was the, the principal logic, I guess, in putting this Canadian money towards the improvement of the fishing industry in the West. And another major force for good in Ireland during this period was the New York Herald Relief Fund. This was established by the proprietor of the New York Herald, Horace Bennett. And it collected money in the States and then forwarded a lot of it to the Mansion House Relief Committee or the Duchess of Marlborough Committee. Another organisation that has to be looked at and that is the role of the Catholic Church. Because from once the crisis started, the Catholic Church, through its network, started looking for funds. We know that major collections were held in places like Bordeaux, in Paris, in Rome, money was sent. But amongst the Catholic communities in the English-speaking world, and you have places like Aberdeen, 
Nottingham, where the collections are carried up by the Catholic clergy there. They were then forwarded to the Archbishop of Dublin, Edward McCabe. And Edward McCabe distributed the money amongst the different dioceses, especially those who were worst off dioceses like Toome, Killala, Connery, which took in Galway, Mayo, Roscommon. And uh, one of the interesting things about the money that the Catholic Church got was it was very often part of it was used for the purchase of seed potatoes for the following year because the great fear was in the crisis people had eaten their seed potatoes so they had no seed potatoes for planting for the following year and if that was allowed to continue you only would have a major crisis again in 1881 so that quite a number of bishops held a certain amount of relief money back so that they could purchase the seed potatoes and in particular a new variety of potato that had come on the market which was felt to be more resistant to blight and this was the champion potato and this is when the champion potato most of it imported from scotland comes into use in ireland So far in this programme we've heard about the selfless giving of the Irish diaspora, the international community and countless others to help avert a major famine disaster in Ireland from 1879 to 1881. At the height of the crisis, over one million Irish people were receiving relief, with the bulk of that relief going to counties like Mayo. Gerard Moore. In a county like Mayo, the figures that are given is 166,000 at this stage who are dependent on the relief organisations. You're talking about, in many areas, okay, up to 80% of the population are now totally, totally dependent. There's nothing else coming in except the relief being provided by the relief organisations. Okay, the, so these relief organisations were absolutely were fundamental, vital. Fundamental, fundamental to the overcoming of the crisis. You had the Americans that they came in with funds. Nancy Smith of the Michael David Museum, situated in Strayed, County Mayo. You had the Marlborough Association, you know, they, they helped to get funding for to help those that were in dire need. And I am talking about dire need because it was nearly as bad along the West Coast as it was in the Great Famine of 46, 47. The diaspora played an absolutely integral role in providing donations to each of the charitable committees. There was a very vibrant Irish community in Buenos Aires who did make a collection and send it. A lot of the people in America who were donating were famine immigrants themselves and this was particularly close to the bone for them. The international community, its operations came in very, very quickly. So when exactly did the famine crisis that engulfed much of Ireland from 1879 onwards eventually come to an end? Dr Regina Donlan, postdoctoral research fellow in NUI, Galway. By the spring of 1881 a lot of developments had been taking place and a few, I suppose, pieces of good fortune came together at the start of the 1880s. The first one was that there had been developments in seed potatoes and people were beginning to embrace these new farming methods and realising the importance of planting particular types of potato in particular types of soil. So that was one very important development. But also, as well as that, there was more favourable conditions for the harvest. You know, the summer wasn't as wet and hot, um, so the chance of blight was a lot less. But as well as this, by 1881, a lot of the infrastructure that had been put in place by the money donated from the Canadian government was beginning to reap rewards. You had improved fishing conditions. The piers that they were building were beginning to, you know, become useful and used regularly. And so... You know, when all of these factors are combined, the worst of it was definitely over by 1881. Yet despite this good news, in some areas pockets of famine continued to linger. Gerard Moore. The theory that, with the longest duration of it, you know, would have been places like Bangararis and parts of Ackle. And the reason being, the variety of potatoes were inferior to ones that they had been distributed in general throughout the country. 
the Irish famine crisis which raged from 1879 to 1881, otherwise known by historians as Ungertibug or the Forgotten Famine, resulted in over one million destitute Irish people facing starvation and death. Thankfully, private charity came to the rescue of most of them. However, there were some deaths. Regina Donnan. There is no doubt that people did die as a result of this famine. And let's be clear about this, it was a famine. And in many parts of Mayo and Galway, it was as bad as the famine of the 1840s. And even though we call it the Forgotten Famine and the Little Famine, and it gets all these labels, for the people that were experiencing it, this was famine at its height. There are deaths, but nothing on the scale that happens during the Great Famine. At one stage, the nation actually carries a section of deaths that are attributed to the famine of 1879, 80, 1880. What kind of figures are we talking about, Jerry? Well, you, the, what you would be talking about is each week, you know, for a number of months, they gave maybe 20 to 30 families that, that they had been told who had died as a result. Yeah. The figures are small. There's no doubt about that. But, and the reason the, why the figures are small is because of the intervention of private relief organisations. What you have to remember is that when you compare the Forgotten Famine of 1879 to that of the Great Famine, the Forgotten Famine, it's the intervention of private relief organisations. You don't have this during the Great Famine on account of the fact that the only group who are really instrumental in the 1845 to 1850 are the Society of Friends. Their contribution was vast, but it was only in certain areas, whereas the 1879 to 1880, you have national relief organisations providing money to virtually every parish or area in the country. In the annals of Irish history, the 1879 to 1881 famine crisis is often overlooked. So why is this the case? Connemara historian Kathleen Villiers Tuttle. It's looked on as the cause of the land wars and the source of the land agitation. It's sort of the starting point. And then they become so involved in the politics of the land wars and the politics of land agitation that they forget about the cause because the cause seemed to have been overcome quite quickly between the charities and the donations that came in and the way the people saved themselves by their families, saved them from abroad, those remittances coming in from abroad. So it was got over faster than the Great Famine in that way. And then you move straight into the political, which is very complicated and that's really why they tended to forget they were you know that was done and dusted happened in between 1878 and 1879 the crisis was 79 the food was brought in they were raised out of it by 1880 1883 you had a very good crop so it was all done and dusted and now you have the politics of the land wars and that got far more attention from historians well, you do see references to the small famine but it's not usually dealt with in its own in its own right it tends to be forgotten as a result of probably a certain shame. People probably don't like to dwell on the bad times. Begging for food is not something which you want to talk about years later. Believe it or not, no less than £2 million. Now that's the equivalent of tens of millions of euro in modern money. was spent to ward off a famine in Ireland from 1879 to 1881. Although the government of the day did what it thought fit, other peoples and groups selflessly helped to save Ireland from a tragic repeat of the Great Famine of the 1840s. So just who are the true heroes of the Forgotten Famine? Regina Donnan. I think the title of hero, I think really if we were to bestow one group of people with it it would be all of the people that gave so generously to the charitable organizations at this time i mean when you think about the amount of money that the mansion house committee was able to distribute the duchess of marlborough committee when you think about how much money the canadian government was able to donate at a time when canada is facing its own challenges the heroes of this story are the people who gave one shilling or five shillings or one pound, whatever they could, 
to help the people of Ireland. And really without the Irish diaspora and Irish Americans in particular, the relief effort would not have been able to be as successful. The money that the diaspora gave was absolutely integral in helping the people of Mayo and Galway in particular, but all over Ireland, particularly Connacht. The distribution of this aid certainly alleviated the situation enormously. Historian Bernard O'Hara. I know there were some deaths, but there weren't that many compared to the Great Famine. It is called the Gertha Bjog, but the work of these relief agencies was absolutely enormous and uh, they certainly deserve to be remembered what they did. Charity really took over for this famine. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.